Welcome to the Zero to Five Million Dollar Podcast. My name is Ollie, and uh, this show is brought to you by Ollie College, the Nail Soft Company. You will notice I am not Sean. Uh, we've had some technical difficulties, but he'll be back for the next episode. That much I promise. Now today, uh, you guys might remember back a while ago. I, I believe it was in Growth Month, our, our month-long virtual conference. We had Andrew Gazdecki on. Now he, I'm going to get the company's name wrong here because they've changed it, but he's the CEO founder of Microacquire, which I think is now Acquire a marketplace where you can go and get your business listed and sold and acquired. Now, my guest today, Michael, has actually been through the process and uh, and he's written about it and told us the intricate details of what he built, why he did it, how he did it, and uh, and how the exit happened. So, Michael, welcome to the show. And um, it's good to have you. Thanks for having me, Ollie. My pleasure. So um, I did a kind of very quick example of what has happened, but I left out quite a lot of details. So, so why don't you start us at day one at zero? What's... um. What even started this journey of going through an acquisition? Yeah, so so what happened was that uh, it, the acquisition happened two years ago, uh, right when I actually left my engineering job at Netflix. And uh, when I left, I was just thinking about like, oh, should I you know, work for myself? Should I just find another job? And it was around that time that uh, my cousin, who was also working at Netflix, told me that he acquired a company on uh, MicroAcquire. And he said that, you know, uh, even though when he acquired it, it was twelve thousand dollars, he was thinking like, you know, if he, the, it was a good investment and a good learning opportunity for him to learn how to, you know, grow and scale a company, see what it takes to incre- increase the enterprise value of a company. So when I heard that, I just decided to uh, just propose to him that he that we split the company fifty fifty, and I would help him uh, grow grow it with him. And uh, he quickly said yes, and uh, that's what uh, started the whole journey. So it's literally like uh, I saw in your article that uh, that we'll put in the show notes. There's a, a a text message exchange where it's basically, "Hey, I've got an idea. Let's do this together." And he goes, "Yeah, sure." It's it's like literally that simple. There's no like long conversations about it. It's that that's it. Yeah, exactly. But uh, the one thing is also I've also I've had a long working relationship with him as well because we tried a lot of startup ideas over the years. So we did have a pre existing relationship. But yeah, it was literally just uh, that text exchange, and that was it. Cool. Okay. That's, that's pretty cool. Uh, obviously the, the pre context makes sense for that being so quick and easy, but okay, that's cool. So in, in your article, you kind of describe you're the growth person and, mm-hmm. and he's the kind of technical person. So what's the first thing you do? Like you agree to do this, then what? So, uh, the, so the moment we bought it, it actually wasn't uh, monetizable at that m- moment. Like there was actually no way to take a uh, payment info. So the first thing we did was uh, just try to increase traffic and then try to monetize this product as quickly as possible. And I know in the article, I, I said that uh, we monetized immediately uh, like the, as the first thing that we did. But actually, I did miss a small step uh, right before that, which was that the very first thing we did was actually change the name of the product, which is actually a very, very important point because the product uh, was called uh, used to be called ShareIt.Video. And the problem was that there were a lot of other websites and a lot of different apps that had very, very similar names. And the issue was that if you search this on Google SEO, we would not even be close to the first page. So the first thing we did was try to rebrand the entire product and we called it RecordJoy just so that there weren't any other products that were even named uh, like something close to that just to try to improve SEO. So once we did the rebrand, then the next thing we did was try to monetize it as quickly as possible. So we started adding, uh, you know, like paid subscription plans. Uh, we tried to integrate with AppSumo to offer lifetime deals. Uh, uh, those are the main things we tried immediately to try to squeeze uh, some money out of it. And uh, the surprising thing was even the, the the very next day after implementing like plan tiers on on the on the product, uh, someone actually signed up. So uh, that was a that was a good decision. Uh, that was a good growth decision for sure. Okay, cool. So basically, immediately, organically, user decides, you know what, I actually want to get the pay plan. So that's good. Beyond that and doing the AppSumo, what roughly is your split in those early days of, because um, obviously AppSumo being like a lifetime deal at a discount area where, where people who are looking for great new products go and, and get it for a smaller price than what it ends up being a couple of years down the line. What, what's your split? Because at a certain point, a company who's growing you need the users to get the feedback, to build the better features, to get the cash flow, but then you want to raise the price and, and go upwards from there. What, what's your sort of split early on? Uh, between the revenue and the lifetime deals? Yeah, or, or a user base as well. I'd be interested in that too. Yeah, so uh, user-wise, we had a people making... 
we had a couple hundred visits per day and it was a, a couple dozen videos being made per day. I'd say that uh, in terms of m uh, monthly revenue, we had about about $150 a month in monthly recurring revenue. And in terms of lifetime deals towards the end when we sold it, it had about maybe five, $600 a month in lifetime deals being sold per month. That's pretty good. So how many users is that? Is that because what's the payment tier plans as well? Because they're... Uh, in, in my experience with AppSumo, you could pick the lower tier and, and get as many as you could, or you could sell it in more bulk kind of thing, but you might get less people. How how does that split happen? On AppSumo, I believe that we only offered one plan, which is one lifetime deal. You pay once, you don't have to pay anymore, and you get all access to all the features. That one was $120. $120. Okay, cool. So you're getting a few users in a month, that type of thing. Okay, awesome. So you do AppSumo, and uh, one of the other big things I meant, uh, that you mentioned sorry, in your article is you started to build the SEO based off of the rebrand as well. So I'm assuming that work starts almost straight away as well? Uh, the the rebrand work actually, so it took it took some time, but uh, the rebrand work, uh, like I'd say maybe like within a month or two, it was already showing up in Google, Google search results. So. Okay. So what kind of traffic levels are we talking about? Where did it sort of end up by time of exit? Uh, by the traffic levels, I think that the SEO bump provided a modest boost, like maybe like a few hundred extra visitors per month or so. Because at the end, like I think that there still wasn't that much uh, like RecordJoy, the product name still wasn't well known at that time. But uh, it, it provides some boost, but it was a modest boost. So. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, well, depending on what level you're at, several hundred is a lot or, or not a lot. So yeah, it's it's relative. Yeah. Okay. So it's the rebrand, Absumo, a bit of SEO starting to bubble in the background. What else was there? I know that you mentioned in the article some partnerships. Was that a big sort of revenue driver or did that just help you get sort of awareness into a bigger market? Uh, we tried a number of different tactics. Like we tried, uh, for example, Google ads. And we also tried, we did try some other uh, lifetime deal partnerships as well. Uh, ultimately, and we also tried content marketing as well. And I think that probably AppSumo and just adding the paid tiers were the most uh, successful growth projects that we tried. I think with Google Ads, for example, I think Google Ads works well if if the price is extremely high, just so that the so that you can recoup the cost of the ads. But uh, it was but with the subscription plan, like we were offering like ten dollars a month, twenty dollars a month, and it just wasn't that like. The conversion, I feel like if you sold like jewelry, for example, where a single product is like thousands of dollars, then the ads made more sense. But for our SaaS product and price point, it didn't make as much sense. We also tried some content marketing at the time, but uh, at the time we didn't really have a large audience. And the content marketing I've realized is something that you have to, uh, like you have to be able to do repeatedly. And with RecordJoy, it's, it was a screen recording tool, like a poor man's version of Loom. And it's kind of hard to come up with new articles about screen recording like every day or every week. Like there are only so many things you can say about a screen recording tool. So uh, like the the well for that kind of dried up. And uh, that's a whole different, and from that learning actually, that's what that's why uh, the, the tactics that both I, me and my founder tried after we exited RecordJoy changed drastically where we started focusing more on audience building and, and just building up a distribution channel was the result of us realizing that uh, we didn't really have a scalable and repeatable distribution channel when building RecordJoy. So uh, I think that was one of the major learnings we had. Yeah, and I, could, I know in um, several video platforms that I've used and uh, like have friends who work in them, Part of the problem, particularly with that market, is video could be so useful in so many different ways and departments that you end up going so broad but not deep into each one. You could say that how video should be used for finance teams, how video should be used for salespeople, marketers, mm -hmm. operations, content, so many spectrums of things where you're not going anywhere deep into it. And that one blog that you do about how to use it for marketing content is barely scratching the surface. You're not actually going to get traffic from that. So how do you pick and where do you go from there? Yeah, exactly. I think that uh, niching and I think that was maybe one of the mistakes that we made was uh, trying to not just say that we're a screen recorder, but a screen recorder for like a specific audience and a specific segment of the population would have been uh, a much uh, more resonant uh, value proposition than what we had. So absolutely. Gotcha. So did you realize that afterwards or, or is that like an along the way thing that you found out? 
I think we realized that kind of towards the end, but then in order to implement that, it would have required such a like a big bet on engineering resources to implement. For example, like a at the end, we were actually debating a lot of things. Like, oh, for, if we wanted to grow this pr- in the product, we were, we were debating, for example, should we try to add ways for videos that people make to be more discoverable on the platform? And then so that that would be one a way to drive growth. We were debating between like, uh, you know, only focusing on the enterprise features, like team sharing features. But all of these things, it was ultimately just me and my cousin running this uh, project. So it would have required a huge engineering investment and it wasn't even clear if it would pay off. And then at that time, uh, he was also accepted to an MBA. So we decided it was better just to sell the product rather than try to um, try to grow it uh, further from there. Gotcha. Yeah. So I was going to get to the acquisition in a moment. So, but one thing that, um, that you, that you said really stood out to me there, I think a lot of people forget about this saying Google ads, expensive ad spend, you've got to make it work. You've got to spend time and money to actually get even a benchmark of data before you can iterate and make it work better again. It's all making it harder when your deal sizes are quite small. Even if it's say a hundred, a couple hundred bucks, particularly lifetime deal, though you, you probably wouldn't be doing Google ads for that if it's on AppSumo. Either way, it's still quite a low average deal size sort of customer value. Yes. When when did you kind of work that out? And I'm, I'm fairly interested if you thought, well, content's kind of a longer term play and how do we do that? So that's difficult. SEO is kind of along the same lines. At what point then did you consider having a sales engine? Because that's when you've got the lower deal size, but you can't really do e-com style ads and content. It's it's difficult. You're always up against the margins, aren't you? Yes. Uh, no, absolutely. And uh, I think that uh, when we made that, I think there there's almost a spectrum that we realized on terms of price and customer acquisition costs where like, and how scalable like the the acquisition channel is. Like for example, you could have something that's free, but then uh, uh, that's free, but then extremely viral, like that grows through viral growth, like a lot of consumer products. And that's on one end of the spectrum. And then on the other end are are products that are extremely expensive, but it requires like these longer sales cycles, like enterprise, like enterprise sales. And that's on the other uh, spectrum. And we were in this middle ground, this really weird middle ground where it's like, we weren't as, like scalable as the consumer products, but then our price points weren't as high as the enterprise products. So then it's like, we're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place at that point. So at that point, we just realized that we either had to pivot to like either side of those spectrums and go hard on that, or uh, what we did was end up selling it. So uh, that that was one learning is that uh, to consider like, I feel there's that middle ground where it's your price point is kind of like a consumer product, but then your like your acquisition channel costs are, basically like just as expensive as the enterprise ones. And at that point, like I would, tr- I really recommend trying to avoid that, that death valley in the middle. So, yeah. Yeah. And that's really awkward because a lot of, a lot of the time a software company gets away with things because their margins are high because it's software. If this was a services company, this would be a terrible business just mm-hmm. because it's like a lot of effort means a lot of bandwidth and cash flow and that type of thing. But what you're making isn't very high. Yes. That's a problem. So I think actually a lot of software companies are, quite bad just the fact that there are software and the margins are okay means they get away with it so at that point you kind of realize let's let's sell while we can before we have to make this huge pivot in which way sort of you're not even guaranteed that one way is going to work or the other one more time effort cash and all that type of stuff too so how do you go about acquiring uh, or getting acquired is it you know of micro acquire is it your always thinking of an exit or just the timing kind of made you guys think and and ask the question, where do we go about this happening? Yeah. So we definitely weren't thinking about the exit uh, when we first started, but uh, we did know about micro acquire the entire time. And so uh, especially because I was in charge of growth. So I was also the person in charge of uh, the acquisition at the end. So I ended up listing record joy on the platform again. And uh, basically we got 20 offers within two weeks from people wanting to like interested in purchasing the product. And these weren't tire kickers. Like they were serious uh, buyers for a variety of different reasons. And uh, from start to finish, I think from the time I listed to the sale, to the money getting transferred to our bank account, it took about one month. So overall I would say the acquisition that was actually fairly quick. And uh, I'll recommend using micro acquire again in the, in the future. Awesome. So a few things stand out to that. Um, the price being one thing, obviously, um, 
any amount of money that's higher than a certain amount sounds like a lot, but in the grand scheme of things, you know, so many companies are worth billions and whatever. It's mm-hmm. it's easy for anything that's not that to sound small. What yes. you've built is a fairly, you know, small company, but I, I don't think that you've made loads and loads of money. And I think that's worth exploring. Yes. Oftentimes everyone glorifies and, and kind of rightly so, you know, the founder made this much and it got worth this crazy valuation and multiple, that type of thing. Mm-hmm. But that's that's not necessarily your story, but there's still really good lessons to be learned from that. So, so kind of tell me about that. No, that's uh, that's maybe the main lesson I learned from this, actually. So we bought it for 12000 We sold it for 20000 And then maybe we made, in the lifetime of the company, we brought it from no revenue to maybe lifetime we made maybe five dollars $6,000. So let's say 25000 total we made. We bought it for 12000 So that's about like 13000 And then I had, we had to cover some costs and split it with a partner. And that was maybe about six, we, we worked on it actively for about six months and then left it in maintenance mode for about six months. So uh, obviously, if you had to divide this by the time between all of us, this, this was not a good, great ROI on, on this project. And uh, that's a warning that I want to tell a lot of uh, software founders as well. And uh, or the reason why I actually stopped building SaaS products and moved on to services business and consultancies after is that uh, the joke in, in with building SaaS is that you spend uh, – you know, you're building a five dollar a month SaaS product just to make a uh, just to make like a hundred bucks a month from from that product. And I think that that was almost exactly the story that happened with RecordJoy. What I've realized from this uh, and what's changed my st- entrepreneurship strategy after this was that I think that there are levels to this entrepreneurship game, and I think that SaaS is actually a more advanced tactic, and that you kind of have to work up towards that. And what I mean by that is that by the levels is that. I think that uh, the, the stories of SaaS products coming out of the gate and making a ton of money are really just anomalies. Are And for most engineers and uh, average uh, entrepreneurs like myself, for 99% of uh, entrepreneurs, I think that it's very, very tough to just try to make a SaaS business work from the beginning. I think that the recommendation I have for listeners here is that, you know, remember that SaaS stands for software as a service. So ultimately, I think that it's better to actually start a services company and then just build things for clients. And then when you, what I see that as is as as is getting paid to do customer research. Because as you uh, run a services business and you, uh, you know, build things custom for the clients, what you're doing is you're learning about the problem. And eventually, when you see a solution that could be generalized for all your clients, which would also reduce your like the time of your engagements in a services business, then that's the time to offer a SaaS uh, business to your clients. And at that point, then you have an existing client base that you can just onboard onto your like your services business, your consultancy. And I think that's the way that the uh, SaaS business is more likely to develop. And that's actually the path that I'm on right now. So uh, the reality is uh, the TLDR is SaaS is hard. I think SaaS is very advanced. And I think you're better off starting a services business and using that as a setup to build a product later rather than just building a product from the very beginning. Uh, so, yeah. And in which case, the profit you're making from the services helps you soften the load of paying for the development of something that's not yet profitable. So that's <laughs> supply and demand. Uh, that's exactly right. And also uh, the f- with services, you're also kind of validating that people want your product because uh, like they're paying for your service at, at that point. So it's clear that you're solving a real need. Whereas if you build so many engineers, they start off just building a SaaS and uh, they launch and then nobody really wants it. And that hap- that story would have been avoided had they started with a services business. It would have been very clear that people didn't want that service from the very beginning. Gotcha. Okay. So I want to ask a couple last questions. I know we've got a few minutes left here. So post acquisition now, apart from the the business model itself, is there any mistakes that you can call back out and think, you know what, I I wish I hadn't done that or we should have done something different? In the, in the acquisition, I think, um, or just, or the building of the company, building of the company. I think that the, one of the main ones was that uh, was first, not understanding the the importance of the distribution channel, like honestly building SaaS, there's so many talented engineers out there. Anyone can build a SaaS and try to recreate the product, but the distribution channel is much, much harder to copy. So I almost feel like the distribution channel is a moat in itself. So I would try to focus on building distribution channels, like building audiences first before building the product. Uh, I think that that's a, that's a bigger risk for the business. The second one was uh, on partnerships as well. I think that... Uh, in the middle of the product, when we were building RecordJoy, someone actually reached out to acquire us maybe about six months in. And it was the guy, the, the 
an IT manager who was just working in the IT space. And he recognized that a lot of people, a lot of companies needed a screen recording tool to uh, record bugs and such to report to companies. And I originally, like we were just debating the sale back and forth and we couldn't agree on our price. And I, but at the end, uh, I realized that instead of selling it to him, that we actually missed a major partnership opportunity instead, where we could have actually just brought him on as a co-founder or offered some sort of revenue split where he had the distribution channel because he had all the companies he could have sold the record droid to. And we had the engineering talent, which uh, he wasn't a, he wasn't able to code. So if we combined forces, I thought that we could have actually probably created more value than maybe even the sale of the company. So I think that uh, another lesson was I realized that partnerships is actually a key driver of growth. And you see this with like even economies too, like countries. The countries that trade the most are the com- are the countries that have the largest economies. And the countries that don't trade are countries like, you know, like North Korea and Iran that have more stagnant economies. So I think that's true for businesses as well. So you have to always be aware of like, Every person that you meet is a potential business partner, and you should always be assessing like what are their assets, their talents, their interests, and ways to combine your talents, assets, and interests together to create even more value. I think that was a major mistake uh, I made when I missed that partnership opportunity. But you saw it, and now you and now you can see it differently. So that's a good lesson learned. I know we've got about a minute left, so I want to make sure that you're able to tell everyone what you now do. The services is a little bit different to, to building another product, and where people can follow you as well. Yes. So I now run an engineering consulting firm where we build uh, custom products for clients. The value proposition for um, the consulting firm is we build ChatGPT apps in one month for 10K. Uh, the company is uh, called uh, All in Engineering Consulting, and you can find us at allinengineeringconsulting.com. Uh, you can also follow me on LinkedIn and Twitter too. I post uh, every day. Awesome. Well, great episode. Um, it's nice to have a story of an exit that wasn't I hope you don't mind me saying this, not a, I made $2 billion on an exit. This is a, an alternate version of the story, which is equally, if not more valuable to listen to and hear the what and the why in the how. So thank you very much for coming on, Michael. This was great. And uh, if you managed to stick around to the end, good job. Well done. You, I respect your attention span. Thank you for that. Just like, subscribe, leave a review, leave a comment, whatever you want to. And we'll see you in the next one, guys. Thanks very much.